Okay. okay, thanks. So the last talk before we can all get some coffee this morning, I'm going to talk about the management of cardiovascular risk. So most of us will know that cardiovascular events remain the most common and can be the most serious complication that are observed in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. And the causes of venous thrombosis were first described back in 1856 by Rudolf Virchow, who's shown in the image here. And they make up this very well-known triad, which includes stasis of blood, hypercoagulability of blood, and um, damage to blood, uh, blood vessel wall. And many of these factors apply to thrombosis in MPN, particularly the first two. We know that stasis can occur due to the hyperviscosity that is observed with elevated blood counts. Um, particularly with uh, red cells, but also platelets and wh white cells to a lesser, ex lesser extent. And there's also an inherent increased clotting potential with the uh, diagnosis of MPM, which is associated with the JAK2 mutation, as well as increased inflammation, which has been mentioned in, in a number of talks already, and is uh, certainly a feature of MPN and cancers in general. <clears throat> so in this talk, I'm going to briefly discuss the causes of thrombosis in MPN, the prevalence of cardio risk factors and cardiovascular risk factors and events, how we assess cardiovascular risk in MPN, and then how we manage cardiovascular risk. I'll then finish by mentioning a very exciting new project that we are developing at Guy's and St. Thomas's, and hope to involve as many of you with as possible, and that's a new smartphone app, um, which we're launching with the MPN voice team. And that's going to, one of the functions of that will allow us to track cardiovascular risk factors, such as biometrics, which could have significant potential benefits in this area. <clears throat> So um, the underlying, this is quite a complicated picture, but the underlying mechanisms which cause thrombosis in MPN are multifactorial, and they're quite nicely summarized in this um, diagram. And it separates the causes into factors that we can assess in the clinic, which is shown on the right there, such as the driver mutation status, and Jack, such as JAK2, age, comorbidities, as well. And then there are also factors that relate to underlying physiology that are more difficult for us to, gener uh, to measure, such as the generation of thrombin, which is a, a clotting protein, and things like activation of myeloid cells, which again are well described in MPN in the scientific literature. We know that the um, increased levels of red blood cells and platelets also pose a risk for thrombosis, which explains why this risk is uh, increased in patients when blood cell counts are not controlled in, in terms of cytoreductive therapies. In ET, however, we know it's a bit more complicated and the platelet number is not actually a very good pre predictor of thrombotic complications, as these often occur in some patients who have low, relatively low or, or even normal platelet numbers. And, they, and other, in other patients, we see thromboses um, that don't develop even at a very high platelet, platelet level. So at GSTT, we wanted to work on a project to see if we could better stratify and identify patients who are at risk of cardiovascular events. And the slide here shows current methods for determining cardiovascular risk. And they rely quite heavily on both age and the history of previous thrombosis, as you can see for PV. That's uh, really the, the extent of it. There are some other things that we look at, but that's, that's the, the mainstay of the um, classification. For ET, it is a bit more complex, and there is a validated scoring system, which I'll describe a bit later, that incorporates the presence of the JAK2 mutation, as well as age and previous thrombosis, and it separates patients into four risk groups. However, the current, um, the, the current um, state of these approaches don't take into account the presence of associated conditions which are recognized as cardiovascular risk factors, such as things like high blood pressure. And we know that these things are very strongly predictive of cardiovascular events in the general population. So at GSTT, we wanted to try and improve on this. And we, um, we wanted to firstly assess the prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors and conditions in our patients. So we've developed a research project which used a machine learning program called COGSTAC to retrieve and standardize data from electronic health records. And this, we did this by identifying the mentions of the cardiovascular risk factors and conditions across patients' health records using this machine learning approach. We then used another platform called MedCat to assess the text within records, and this allowed us to identify any synonyms for the terms that we were looking for, and also determine the context of, of each mention. So as you can see in the image, shown here, this is a, a mock-up of a patient letter with a patient with an ET. We could perform a search for cardiovascular risk factors, looking for things called SNOMED codes. Uh, the MedCat would then identify CVA as a synonym for stroke, for example, and it also detects that the patient has hypertension. 
However, the family history of myocardial infarction is recognised as not relating to the patient, and so this wasn't included. I should mention that the MedCat tool was actually developed initially on over 18 million patient records, uh, and we further fine-tuned this in our own analysis, looking at 500 documents from MPN patients specifically in this context. So moving on to the results, and these, uh, this is from our initial analysis of our ET cohort of patients, and this is due to be presented at the American Society of Hematology meeting in, in a few weeks' time. So with regards to the prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors, we saw diagnoses of hypertension or high, high blood pressure in 21% of cases, elevated cholesterol in 10% of cases, and diabetes in just under 5%. With regards to cardiovascular thrombotic events, we observed myocardial infarction, which is heart attack, in 4% of cases, stroke in 8%, and overall cases of venous thrombosis in 14%. And these figures are in keeping with those that have been described in other cohorts that have collected data using more traditional manual methods. So it looks like our, our data seems to be quite accurate. And um, as would be expected, we also saw in our ET patients that those with high blood pressure shown here, were more likely to also have stroke. And similarly, patients with high blood pressure were also more likely to develop venous thrombosis. More recently, we've performed the same analysis in our cohort of 360 patients at Guy's and, and St. Thomas's with a PV diagnosis. And this takes the total number of patients that we analyzed to over 900, and the total number of documents that we've um, reviewed to over 20,000. And on this slide, we compared a frequency of events in the PV cohorts with that that is observed in, in ET. And we observed a proportionally significantly higher prevalence of stroke in PV patients, which is shown here. And we also observed an increased incidence of from venous thrombotic events, including portal vein thrombosis and um, overall total venous thrombotic events. And that's in keeping with the literature that generally suggests that PV is, is a higher risk for, for thrombotic um, events than ET. Moving on to another aspect of our research, which involves the use of something called the Q-Risk Free Score. So the Q-Risk Free Score is a validated algorithm that estimates an individual's um, risk of experiencing a cardiovascular event. And it takes into account various clinical, clinical, clinical details, including the cardiovascular risk factors that are not incorporated in, in other scoring systems that are specific to MPN at the moment. And that includes things like high blood pressure, but it also looks at demographics such as age and even location. So we carried out this assessment in our patient cohort, and we saw that firstly, only a very small proportion of patients who were previously in, classified as low or intermediate risk groups using our standard approach would actually be reclassified as high risk. So only 2% of patients with ET and only 5% of PV patients were upgraded to a higher risk category using the Q-Risk Free Score, and we used the standard threshold of 7.5%, which is um, described in the literature. Significantly, though, we did show that baseline Q-Risk Free Score is quite strongly predictive of thrombotic events, and this was through a retrospective analysis of patients with confirmed thrombosis compared to those in the lower intermediate groups, and that was the case for both the ET cohort and the PV cohort. Um, and I'd like to thank Andrea Dominuco, who's somewhere here in the audience. Um, he's helped a lot with this work. He's a visiting haematologist from Sicily, who's sadly now gone back to Sicily, but he's here for the weekend. So as mentioned earlier in ET, there is a widely used scoring system that can be used to assess risk of thrombosis, and that's the International Prognostic Score of Thrombosis, or IPSET T-score. And this was first initially developed around 10 years ago when it separated patients into three risk groups, so low, intermediate, and high risk groups for thrombosis, uh, which is demonstrated by this graph, which nicely shows the different uh, categories. And that was um, incorporating these, these factors here, so age, um, cardiovascular risk factors, previous thrombosis, and presence of the JAK2 mutation. Um, however, this, this, date, this uh, score was actually revised in 2016 following reanalysis of the same IPSET data set, and it now separates patients into four groups, including a very low risk group, which is shown here, which includes patients who have not had a previous thrombosis, are less than 60 years, and don't have the JAK2 mutation. And this scoring system now doesn't include the presence of, of cardiovascular risk factors. So I'll move on to the management of cardiovascular risk, and, and for completeness, I'll go briefly go through some of the general medical modifiable factors that we are aware of that can reduce cardiovascular risk. So firstly, high blood pressure. This increases cardiovascular risk through damage to blood vessels and promotion of 
um, promotion of arterial stiffness, actually. And, and in view of this, blood pressure should generally be maintained at less 140 over 90. Elevated cholesterol levels, particularly the low-density lipoprotein, or LDL, contribute to the formation of atherosclerotic plaques, which thicken arteries. And so cholesterol, total cholesterol which should be maintained at less than five, with LDL less, at, less than four, and HDL, which is a protective form of cholesterol, should be maintained at greater than one. Diabetes impacts on blood vessel health as well, and metabolism, and so HbA1c should be maintained at less than 42. And smoking cessation is also strongly encouraged, and patients should aim also to control body mass index where possible, as excess body weight and, and fatty tissue can contribute to insulin resistance and development of diabetes, as well as abnormal cholesterols collectively or elevating cardiovascular risk. And there's also some increasing evidence to suggest that the uh, sleep plays an important protective factor in, the, in prevention of cor coronary artery disease, with some studies um, reporting that six to eight hours of sleep is, is actually recognized as a protective factor in this area. So moving on to more MPN-specific areas and looking specifically at treatments that we have to prevent and reduce the risk of clot clotting events, antiplatelet therapy is a cornerstone of management of MPN. So this includes drugs such as aspirin and clopidogrel, which we've heard about this morning. And these drugs reduce platelet function, but they don't actually affect the number of platelets, typically. And these drugs are typically recommended in all MPN patients, other than those who have history of bleeding events or, or extremely high platelet counts in whom actually the risk of bleeding is, is higher. Um, the evidence for the use of aspirin came from this study shown here, which is the ECLAP study. Uh, it's a European collaborative study that was published back in 2004, and it demonstrated significantly reduced rates of thrombosis in those patients taking aspirin compared with placebo. One recent development in this area, however, is the, um, it relates to ET, ET patients who have the CALAR driver mutation. And recent data in this area found that there was no benefit for the use of aspirin. And they actually observed a higher rate of thrombosis in patients with the CALAR driver mutation who were taking aspirin, as shown by this black bar that's um, in the square there. So further studies are required to look at this in a bit more depth, but it's certainly recognized that CALAR isn't associated with the same degree of thrombotic risk as, as JAK2, for example. With regards to systemic anticoagulation, so this is the use of drugs such as warfarin or heparin, and even newer direct oral anticoagulants, and these are typically used for secondary prevention of thrombosis. So these, this is when patients who've had a thrombotic event, they'll typically require these treatments to prevent further recurrence of these, and this is required long-term, typically. Moving on to some other treatments, and venesection is a first-line management option for patients with PV um, who are not considered high-risk for thrombosis. So for those who are unfamiliar, this involves removing around 350 to 400 mils of blood, which results in the reduction of iron stores by about 250 milligrams, and this induces a state of iron deficiency. So venesection is typically offered when patients with PV have a hematocrit of greater than 45%, in most cases, sometimes lower, but where did this figure come from? Because that's actually lower than the, the normal range. And this was addressed by the CYTO-PV study, which randomized PV patients into a high hematocrit, hematocrit cohort of 45 to 50% and a low hematocrit cohort of less than 45%. And as this graph shows here, the proportion of patients who remained thrombosis-free was, was significantly higher in the patients with the low hematocrit group, with only 2% of, of this group having an event, compared with 10% in the high hematocrit group. So that's where that figure comes from. In 1997, however, it was another study, the Polycythemia vera study group, compared the use of venesection to cytoreductive therapy with hydroxycarbamide, and it was shown that there were significantly higher rates of uh, thrombosis in those patients having venesection alone compared with those receiving hydroxycarbamide. So I'll briefly mention another study, and uh, we have to mention the magic study in every uh, talk the, over the last couple of days, so I, I've put another slide in this, on this today. Um, so this is a really interesting UK investigator-led study led, led by Professor Harrison, and um, it compared ruxolitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor, which many people will be aware of, in PV patients who are intolerant or resistant to hydroxycarbamide, so it's as a second-line therapy. And that's of relevance in this, in this talk because it showed an improvement in event-free survival, which is shown at the, in uh, the graph at the top here, 
but specifically it also showed a, an improvement in thromboembolic event-free survival, so a reduction in the risk of thrombosis in patients receiving ruxolitinib. And interestingly, as, as we've probably heard in other talks, a molecular response, which is defined as a 50% or greater reduction in the JAK2 allele burden, correlated with a reduced event-free survival and overall survival. And this is really relevant at the moment because ruxolitinib has just gained nice approval as a second-line treatment for polycythemia vera, um, largely off the back of this, some of this data. So moving on to look at cytoreductive therapies in essential thrombocythemia. Hydroxycarbamide, most people will be aware of, aware of, and this remains the most commonly used cytoreductive agent across MPN, although there is increasing use of, of other agents. So hydroxycarbamide is an inhibitor of DNA synthesis. So it targets any rapidly dividing cells in the bone marrow in quite a non-specific way, and then reduces peripheral blood counts in doing so. The seminal paper that confirmed the benefit of hydroxycarbamide was led by Professor Barbui and colleagues in Italy, uh, up shown up here, and that was published back in 1995 in the New England Journal of Medicine. So they performed a randomized controlled trial in patients who were considered to be high risk for thrombosis. So most patients were over 60 years of age, and half had actually had a prior thrombosis. And patients received either hydroxycarbamide, aiming to maintain a platelet count less than 600, or best available therapy in the form of venesection. Uh, as demonstrated in, 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 in the graph sh shown here, Patients um, in the hydroxycarbamide group had a significantly lower rate of thrombosis, with around 10% having, uh, having an event, compared with 30% of those receiving uh, other treatments. So one grey area with regards to the management of ET patients is those who are considered to be intermediate risk for thrombosis. So that's those patients who are aged between 40 and 60 years and who have not had a prior thrombotic event. A UK study that was led by Dr. Godfrey in, from Cambridge addressed this question, and this was published in, back in 2018 in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, following recruitment over around 15 years. And they actually showed no benefit for the addition of hydroxycarbamide to aspirin in this patient group, with no difference in the rates of events, um, as shown by the graph here. In addition, there was no benefit in the reduction of myelofibrotic or leukemic transformation, which suggests that in, in this group, most patients can be observed and don't require hydroxycarbamide. But. So for the final part of the talk, I'm going to introduce another new approach to this assessment of patients with MPN. And we're launching that today, actually, and that's the new patient-centered MPN smartphone app, which is called My MPN Voice. And I'd encourage everyone, if you're interested in this, to talk to a member of the MPN Voice team or a member of the Sanius team. So Sanius is a health biotech company, and we should have some people present in the audience today, potentially, from Sanius who can help uh, um, discuss this with you later. Um, so the aim of this project is broadly to gain a better insight and understanding of the lived experience of patients with MPN. And we have a research project that's running alongside this. So we're going to collect data from free, patient, from free sources. We'll collect uh, patient-reported outcomes, which includes the MPN10 score, as well as a number of other scoring systems, such as EQ5D5L, which is a quality of life assessment. And there's quite a lot of interest at the moment in the use of these patient-reported outcome monitoring, and that was published in a, a, a very um, uh, interesting study that was from the Amer Journal of the American Medical Association a couple of years ago, which actually demonstrated improvement in overall survival in patients with metastatic solid tumour um, who engaged in a patient-reported symptom monitoring program. So specifically in this talk, in, in relation to cardiovascular risk, we're also going to collect biometric data, um, and that will be collected through the use of clinical-grade wearable devices, which feed directly into the app. So that will be things like vital signs, activity indexes, and sleep scores. And finally, we'll also collect um, medical health records from patients' electronic health records if, if people consent to that. So shown on these slides, that this are some prototype images of how the app is going to look. And this is the biometric data. So the app has the capacity to track things like activity levels, heart rates, and sleep scores over time. And as I, as I say, this feeds directly into the app from a wearable device which I'm supposed to be trialing myself, but I left it at home today, so that's not a good, <laughs> good start. <laughs> uh, but it should be noted that these grants have been, um, th these devices have been granted FDA approval, and that's the official regulatory body for any uh, healthcare products in the US. 
So an example of how these biometric data can be used in a research setting, and this has led to some interesting findings in a, that are shown here from an analysis of patients with sickle cell disease in whom a very similar app has been developed. So the group from Sanius and colleagues looked at sleep scores in their patient cohorts, and they actually found that deep sleep showed an inverse relationship with the quality of life score EQ5D5L. So they saw a higher quality of life in patients who had less deep sleep. Similarly, there was an inverse relationship with hemoglobin and deep sleep scores in a small number of patients, which demonstrates how we can also incorporate clinical parameters such as blood results into this analysis. Uh, so shown here is another image of how the MPN10 score is going to look. So the MPN10 score many people will be familiar with. This uh, ranks the 10 most common symptoms observed in MPN patients on a 0 to 10 scale, and that can be um, plotted over time showing nice trends in symptom burden, which could then be shared with clinicians or research teams to monitor the, any, the impact of any interventions or look for signs of disease progression, for example. Uh, yeah, and that's it today. So, <laughs> I thought I had some more time. <laughs>